I am beginning a video, which is for a backup video for ancient history on Thursday, September 3rd, which happens to be the fourth day of class and the second time that you all B students are here. Miss Anderson? What? Is that you? Yeah. I called you and I didn't. Yeah, but I didn't hear it. And I obviously didn't hear it. Because I said, Miss Anderson, I guess you're not here. Okay, well, I will I will fix it. I will take care of it at the end of class. Can you remind me on the way out, please? Okay. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad you're here. I like having you here. Please make sure that your book is away. Silly. You know better than that. And uh, that your notes are out and that your packets are out. We're going to be doing that. Okay. First off. One of the things that is not often discussed in terms of the weirdness of 2020 is the fact that we teachers are looking at a bunch of masked zombies. At least that's how it looks to us. Human beings, in the course of our natural interactions, talk and listen. And we express ourselves through the words we choose, the tones we have, the body language, and this amazing face that we have. But I can't see your face. And your other teachers can't either. And that's a problem. Because you may want to express things either to your teachers or to one another using the natural modes of expression that human beings have, which are particularly uh, modes that involve... Huh? Or, <laughs> or, or any number of other things without the sound effects. But all I see are your eyes. Now, looking directly into a person's eyes is something that in our culture is something that you do occasionally, but not constantly. For example, when you meet somebody for the very first time, uh, presumably we'll get back to this, you firmly shake their hand and you look them in the eye. Also, sir, during the course of a conversation, when you're relating to somebody, you look them in the eye. But we don't stare constantly at a person looking in their eyes, because that's a challenge. If you doubt me, if you doubt the essential nature of that challenge, open notebook, step out, and please do put the book away. Uh, if you understand, that, uh, if you don't understand this, Try it with your cat or your dog. Sit down with them and hold their eyes, hold eye contact. Don't blink. And see how they react. They'll be like, oh, I love you. You, you messing with me? You, they, you No, their entire body language will change because you're challenging them. So I can get a few things from looking you in the eye. And I do look people in the eye as I go around the room. But unless there's something truly unusual going on, I'm not going to hold eye contact, which is really what's necessary to read somebody's expression simply by looking at the orbs. In Mass Effect, which is a series of video games, there's an entire race of beings called the Elcor, who are like big cows, and they don't get this facial expression thing or this nuanced tone thing that we ape-descended primitives use. So they will, in interacting with us to prevent needless wars and needless conflicts, start out with a parenthetical phrase explaining their intent. Curiously, how was your night last night? Did you do anything interesting? Evasively, I don't want to talk about my light, not night last night. It was awful. Now, that may seem silly, which it is kind of, and funny, which it is kind of, but bear in mind, the people around you cannot read you the way they normally can. And if there's something that you're trying to convey, communicate, do so more overtly. Maybe with silent movie body language or words or something. Just be aware of that because it's a little freaky. Not your fault, by the way. And it's not the fault of the people around you. It's just the way people are. It's the way we're wired to be. So, any questions from yesterday before we go into today? There you were, sitting at home, watching. Yes. 
Um, I had a question about uh, both the questions, like the if, uh, the if and the then questions. Yeah. So I was wondering, like, are are those the questions we're supposed to write an essay about, or are we only supposed to like? You're supposed to write an essay uh, answering this question. Who do you think the war on terror is against? In other words, who's the enemy? And depending upon that answer, that will dictate how we fight the war on terror. That's all. It wasn't due, supposed to be done last night. It is due, no, 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 no. It is due, as I said, the day after we as a class see the movie Obsession, Radical Islam's War Against the West. If you have parental permission, which you have to turn in next Tuesday, uh, by Wednesday next week at 3 p.m., but you're going to be here Tuesday, so presumably you'll turn it in Tuesday. Uh, if you have permission to see that film, when I'm done lecturing about uh, the background to the terror attacks, I'll show the movie, and then the next day, the essays come due. Okay? So if, if you haven't yet adjusted your syllabus on the front page, which you should have out, the answer is uh, for the assignment, uh, Essays on Terrorism, it is due the day after we see the Obsession movie. And I don't know when that is. That'll depend on when we get there. So, did that answer? Oh, uh, please go yes, on. Yes, that answered my question about the essay. But Give me more! <laughs> for the questions that we have, the if and then questions, yep. are we only supposed to add our opinions or are we supposed to... No, you are supposed to say in your own words, I think the enemy and the war on terror are the Swiss. You wouldn't think the Swiss are the enemy, but let me tell you why. And because the Swiss are the enemies in the war on terror, the war on terror is a matter of international banking and finance. Uh, and, and then you go into some details. That's what I want from you. Okay. okay? And that's due... And that's due the day after we have the obsession movie. Okay. Because that's, that's the day after we are done instructing about terrorism. Okay. Make sense? Yes, thank you. Thank you for asking. Other questions from yesterday or from any time before? Good. Okay, I'm going to summarize my movie policy, and uh, then we'll go back to the chapter survey. My movie policy can be expressed in three simple statements. Yes to battlefield violence. There's a series of video games called Fallout. The last full one I played with all the DLCs was Fallout 3. And the main game ends with the character uh, or, you know, somebody striding through the wilderness in these sort of flashbacks. War never changes, the narrator says, and there's boom, the somber music in the background. Well, what they meant was that war is always murderous misery. And that's true. War is hell, literally. But, damn it, war does change. It matters if you have 15 guys whamming on each other with bare hands, clubs, and rocks. Or if you have 2,000 guys in chariots trying to spear one another on an Egyptian plain. Or if you have a bunch of Greeks outside of a city wall swinging uh, bronze weapons and wearing bronze armor. Or if you have 25,000 Romans in steel body armor with steel weapons fighting a bunch of blue-painted Irishmen. Or are they medieval knights with armor? riding heavy war horses, or longbowmen, or pikemen, or harquebusiers. Harquebusiers are people who use the harquebus, which is an early firearm. Or flintlock mis uh, musketeers, or cartridge bolt-action rifles, or machine guns, or lasers. It matters how we fight our wars. That really does change. And the warfare of a given society and period reflects that society and period. So I'm going to show you film clips that deal with war and battlefield violence. I'm not going to have uh, these clips selected because they focus on, like, the first 20 minutes of Saving Private Ryan, human intestines falling out of human bodies and floating around on the ground going, Ugh. because there are plenty of other World War II movies that deal with the violence without doing that. My goal is to show you the time and place. So yes to battlefield violence. Stage, uh, statement two, yes to harsh language. When you're on a battlefield or in some kind of existential struggle, that's a struggle for life, for your existence, you might curse a bit. Certainly, in reality, people do. So harsh and salty language, yeah, you'll see that in the film clips too. What I promise not to do is to show explicit strong sexual content for two reasons. 
One, that doesn't change. With the exception of the uh, sort of peripheral standards of hygiene and beauty from time to time, society to society, how we do our loving is basically now as it was before we learned how to farm. So there's no reason to show that in a history classroom. Plus, it's oogie. That's a technical term. Oogie, icky, yucky. Why would anyone want to see anything even remotely erotic in a, in a history classroom? So we're not. So yes to battlefield violence, yes to harsh language, uh, and no to strong sex. In a few weeks, I plan on showing you uh, extended clips from a movie called Quest for Fire, which deals with human beings in a very primitive state. And there's an incredible scene. It follows evolutionary theory, so just accept it whether or not you believe it. Uh, where a group of late Homo erectus, proto-humans, are sneaking up on the cave occupied by a group of early modern humans. Interspersed with the dramatic scenes of the stalking of this cave before dawn, a caveman and a cavewoman decide they're going to have uh, some carnal knowledge of one another. So what I intend to do is stand here as the scene is playing out and cover it intermittently during those naughty bits. And then when the uh, naughty bits are done, uh, let the violence ensue. If you or your family is basically okay with these policies, I presume you will have checked off yes. Now, there are some R-rated films that I use clips from. I do not show R-rated films in there entirely, but I do show clips from R-rated films that I don't think is R-rated content because they happen to do the best job of depicting the history. That falls under my cl classifications of yes to violence, yes to harsh language, no to strong sex. Some of your families, no doubt, will object to a movie on the list, the list of movies that you see in your packet. Uh, I don't show all of them every year, but I might show them. They're the kind of movies I do show. There are some movies that came up after I made that list, but if you see a movie on the list that, that you or your family doesn't want you to see, fine. Put an X in front of that movie. For example, in European history, I'm showing a movie called Luther in its entirety, because I think it's a good explanation of the Protestant Reformation. But Luther was made by Lutherans, so it puts Martin Luther in a happy light. And I've had students who've come from traditional families of other denominations who don't want their kids or who don't want themselves to see something that's pro-Luther. As a result, they don't see it. But I don't have a central clearinghouse where all of this is stored in my mind or on paper. I do not promise to enforce this. It is up to you each to look at the movies that I'm showing and to decide if you want to see that clip at that moment. So if you come from a traditional family or you don't think that you're up to the violence or whatever, when I say, okay, we'll see a film clip, I might indicate there's going to be violence or that there's going to be harsh language. For example, tomorrow, we're finally getting away from this rule stuff and we're getting into the history. And in addition to a shortish lecture, I'll be having you watch two uh, clips, uh, two uh, clips from two movies. And one movie will be violent and the other movie will have harsh language. Anytime you don't want to see a film clip in person, all you have to do or a movie is raise your hand and sort of point to the door inquiringly. And I'll say, sure, if it's a short clip, you'll wait on the porch. If it's a long clip or an entire movie, I'll have you go to the NPR and you'll do some work. If I'm going to show an entire movie and you're going to miss it, I will probably have you do a small homework assignment so that you can study some of the things that your classmates will have seen directly from the film. It's up to you. But you don't need parental permission not to see a movie. Let's say you come in here and your stomach's feeling a little queasy. Or something really big is happening at home. You've got family members who are ill or there's something just going on and you just aren't in an emotional state to see a bunch of guys bayoneting each other. Well, raise your hand, go out. It's fine. It's your choice. Don't abuse the privilege, but it, it, no, it's your choice, it's your privilege, so please make a choice that's wise for you. But I'm telling you right now, and I'm telling those of you at home, I have asked because I'm explaining the policy. 
but it is the student's responsibility and the family's responsibility to remind me. I have no time to remember this for you. And you are responsible aged teenagers. So be responsible. Any questions on the movie policy? Or policy is uh, this is all laid out in the class policy stuff. Okay. Next. I told you that you would need seven to ten hours to do your earliest chapter surveys, and I mean it. You should budget that amount of time. Now, you may be an unusually disciplined or tight thinker, in which case you may not need that even on your first try. But if you budget that amount of time, you will have enough time to do it and do it well. If you leave it to the last minute and try to do it in two hours, you will produce a piece of garbage, and it will get the grade deserving of that. Budget seven to ten hours at first. But you will quickly find, as time goes on, once you do a couple of these, how to do it better. And the normal time it takes for a person to do one of these right is three to four hours. That is one assignment a week from me, and that is well within reason. So expect your earliest chapter surveys to take you longer than normal, because your later chapter surveys, once you learn how to do them, will take you less time than normal. Having said all of that, if I was you, I'd find a friend who was a good student in period four, five, or six. Doesn't matter, it's the same course. A or B, doesn't matter, it's the same course. And divide up the work. So say, for example, you've got two friends that want to work with you in collaboration on chapter survey one. Fine. One of you takes the Paleolithic era, one of you takes the Neolithic era, one of you takes the first cities and civilizations, and you come together in a study group, person in person or online, and uh, share your information. That's fine as long as you share the information. If you just go matching A, B, C, C, B, A, A, B, C, D, and that's the only thing that's exchanged, you're cheating yourself and you're wasting your time. This is not homework for nothing. It is not busy work. I am trying to get your mind to deal with, in, with key information in ways other than listening to me. So I expect you to do the work by saying, number one, who built the pyramids? The Egyptians. Number two, who built the ziggurats? The Babylonians or the Mesopotamians. Number three, what's different between a pyramid and a ziggurat? Well, pyramids are bigger and they're pointier. Uh, and ziggurats are used as observatories and so on and so forth. You can work with one another by exchanging information. Here's the biggest temptation if you're working with one another on a chapter survey. When you do the document analyses, the opposed views and the other, when you do the uh, essays, the temptation is going to be to have one person do one essay, one do the second, one do the third. One person can research the first, another the second, another the third. But I swear to you, if you copy each other's works or closely paraphrase each other's works, you are plagiarizing. Don't do that. I have one simple rule for writing, but it is an absolutely serious rule. Write everything in your own words, in your own voice. Don't ever claim somebody else's words as yours. And there are two basic reasons for it. I don't think they're nonsense, nor are they school nonsense. I think they're genuine. Number one, if you can put ideas into your own words, then you know the idea. If you're trying to write about something and your brain says, Hey you, what brain? Don't really know this enough to write about it, do you? Guess not. Well, maybe you have to learn more to write about it. That's a way for your brain to tell you you need to learn more. You deprive yourself of that if you simply slavishly copy someone else's ideas. So again, the meaningfulness of the homework is stolen if you steal somebody else's words. Secondly, it's bad for your integrity. Honesty is important. A person with honor will be trusted by people. A person who is dishonest, lying, and a sneak will be distrusted by the people around them. And in 55 years of life, I can tell you, there's nothing more precious than a person's trust. Because trust is the basis of friendship, it's the basis of love, it's the basis of all meaningful relationships. And if you violate others' trusts, they won't trust you again in the same way. 
They will never see you in the same light, not unless they're capable of seeing redemption in you, if you truly change. So don't write what the others say word for word. Get an idea, put it in your own words, and you'll be fine. Want to use a quote? Use a quote. Any questions about the um, collaboration? I encourage you to work with one another. I'm not going to organize it for you. That's your job. But if you want to work for, with one another, do so. Just always put things in your own words. Please. Wait, what? You can partner up anytime you want. This particular assignment is due to uh, September 21st. So my advice is, if you want to seek partners, between now and the middle of next week, get partners, divvy up the work, and set up a, a time for you to get together, either in person or online, so that you have time to do your last-minute work. Make sense? Yeah. I'm trying to give you every benefit that you possibly can have to do this in a good, successful, and meaningful way. How I grade homework. When I was born, I was born cross-eyed. That means that instead of my eyes turning in tandem, they turned in opposition. It's not a good thing to have, not only because it's cosmetically hideous, or at least, huh? but it's also uh, just difficult to see well if you are cross-eyed. So when I was six to nine months old, my parents had me go into a well-thought-of eye surgeon in Manhattan. And um, he was going to slice some muscles and restitch them so that my eyes would come back into a normal relationship. That surgery, by the way, was even at, in its, at its best, only limitedly successful. You'll note that when I'm tired or distracted, my left eye goes and does its own thing. It, it moves, it twitches, it does what it does. <clears throat> There were bandages on me for about six weeks, and there were repeated appointments for the next three months. Near the end of all of this, the surgeon said, oh, by the way, you know your son's blind in his left eye, right? What we think happened is that the surgeon had an oops and sliced through most of my optic nerve between my left eye and my brain. I have 2,400 vision in my left eye that is legally blind. Uh, when I close my right eye, I can see things as if it's midnight and there's no moon. Um, very dark, very blotchy, I can see movement. When my right eye is open, there are massive blind spots. Because of this, and perhaps just because of the way my mind works, I don't read quickly. I'm on the slow side when it comes to reading, just in terms of speed. My wife, on the other hand, is, she isn't a speed reader, but she's practically as fast as one. She can just slurp a book in a single day. 600-page book, done. I can't do that. I assign you extensive amounts of writing because it's good for you. First of all, it'll help you understand the history better. Secondly, it'll help you be a better writer. And being a good writer is a universally uh, a, a helpful talent to have. It'll also help you think more clearly. But I don't have the ability to read all of it. So this is what I do. I pick three or well, two, three or four sections, depending, of the assignment that I'm going to check on everyone's paper. And that is going to be the representative sample. I read those sections closely. And from the quality of those, I make a judgment about the quality of the rest. I infer that if these three sections are B quality work, the rest is two and you get a B. Now you might react and say, but that's not fair. We have to spend all this time writing all this stuff and you're not even going to read most of it. Yep. But I am going to read a random sampling, and you will not know, and I don't even know before I start correcting, what that random sampling is going to be. Again, I have you write because I believe that it is good for you as a person, as a student of history, and as a, uh, a, a person who's going to be working in the future. But I don't have time to read it all. That is the reality. And in all the years of teaching, this is the best answer I've come up with. I'm not trying to hide anything from you. This is the way I work. Now, if, for example, you feel that there's a deeply unjust grade that you've received, come and talk to me. Do not come in hot. Do not come in angry. I will intentionally shut you down and not even listen to you because the purpose is not to have an argument. If you've got a problem, come in and say, look, 
I'm concerned about the grade I've got. Can you look at these sections? The sections you looked at may have been mediocre. But look over here. Look at this. Look at this. I think I did really good work here. Will you look at it? I'll look at it. I'll listen to what you have to say. And I will make the fairest decision I can. The fairest decision isn't always giving you what you want just because you ask. But it might be giving you what you want because what you're asking is the right thing to do. So you can always come talk to me if you have a concern about a grade that you got on a homework assignment. If you're going to do it every time, after a while, I'm just going to say, look, it's my judgment. I am a professional. I'm allowed to make these judgment calls. Uh, obviously, uh, your, you, your mind and mine don't work in harmony. This is what you need to do to get a better grade for me. Do what you want. But I will listen. Seriously. Any questions about how I grade homework? Or comments. Oh, it's so horrible. It is what it is. But I am happy to talk about it if you want a little more. By the way, I am by no means the only teacher that does this. I hope that uh, I may be rare in, in that I talk about it so openly. But it's what I, I want you to know how things really are. Okay. Take out your chapter survey, please, which is the page that is landscape style in your syllabus pack, just about halfway, two-thirds of the way through the syllabus pack. It looks like this. This is the thing we went through yesterday. It has the matching. That's it. And the multiple choice sections looks like this. Good. Looks like this. Keep going. Oh. I think it's before that, actually. But it's the only one that is uh, landscape style. Good, 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 good. Good. What? Today? Third. September 3rd. Okay. Babu. So, yeah. There you go. Okay. Yesterday, online, uh, through the live stream, you would have seen me take people through matching and multiple choice. I will start again with some basics. The questions are from Baker. Baker wrote a book dealing with Spielvogel, analyzing it in preparation for advanced tests like the AP test. I've used Baker as an adjunct to Spielvogel since 2006 when I first taught AP, AP Europe. Uh, and so what I have done is I've bought enough copies for the classroom so that I have the legal right to then copy it to my students' personal email. I sent you, I think, all an email that has the link to the shareable documents. Um, if you don't have that, if you look later and can't find it, you should email me. And I will either put something on the Google Classroom page or I'll email you the shareable link directly. In any case, that's where the questions are. The uh, Baker section starts with uh, an outline of the chapter, a description of what's important in the chapter, according to Baker, and a list of key themes and topics that are addressed in the chapter. If you have trouble getting information from a history book, it's not a bad idea to look at that Baker stuff before you read the chapter, because it can help you uh, ready your mind. It's like, oh, what are we having for dinner tonight? Well, if the answer is uh, fish, fried fish with, with french fries or fish and chips, uh, as opposed to we're going to have uh, fried chicken or we're going to have roast beef uh, or if we're going to have beans and vegetables, if you are of the vegan or vegetable vegetarian persuasion, whatever it is, you're, you're gonna, your stomach's going to be ready for it. If you come home ready for a fried chicken dinner, and suddenly you are faced with liver and onions or, I don't know, spaghetti and sauce or fried fish or tofu and uh, salad, you're going to be a little disappointed. So the baker could actually help you get more out of reading the chapter. But then you come to Baker Section 5, which is matching. You'll have a list of names and a list of descriptions. If, for example, number one is Moses and description E is Jew, a Hebrew patriarch who leads the Israelites out of Egypt and presents the Israelites with the Ten Commandments, that's Moses. So you'd put a capital E in front of the one. 
In the multiple choice section, there are 20 questions there. If the first question is, the civilization built pyramids, had mummies, worshipped Bass, the cat goddess, and uh, was situated along the mouth of the Nile River, <clears throat> and the answers were the Mesopotamians, the Babylonians, the Cretans, and the Egyptians, the answer is D, the Egyptians. So you put a capital D next to the number one here. By the way, these are not the actual questions. Uh, there's a section after multiple choice that we don't do that's sort of a sentence with a fill in the blank. But after that, there is placing things in order. And if you had events like um, the establishment of the Roman Republic, uh, the uh, discovery of fire, uh, the cave paintings at Lasco, and uh, the first farm at Jarmo, it would be the discovery of fire, the cave paintings at Lasco, the first farm at Jarmo, and the establishment of the Roman Republic. And you just write them in order here in some abbreviated form that everyone can understand. That's how far we got yesterday. Any questions on any of that? Because you had to follow it at home, and that's not always easy to do. Yes? Oh, well, you might cover it later, but is are there actual questions in like the baker that yes. you sent us? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's that's yeah. That's that's exactly right. You can't do this without the baker. So having the baker is very important. Baker is a workbook that I have scanned and that I have emailed you links to. So look on your email for an old link that'll have a shareable link that will get you into the files, okay? If you don't have it, again, I may put it again on the uh, Google Classroom, but if you don't have it personally, email me and I'll, I'll try to email you that link directly if, if, if I don't put it on the Google Classroom. Okay. <clears throat> Opposed views and the document analyses, which is the rest of page one. In chapter one, we've got the opposed views section, which is on a pinkish page. It looks like this. Not many pink pages in your textbook. This is a pinkish page. And it says, this is a print, by the way. It tells you it's the opposed views section because it says opposed viewpoints in big letters at the top. Now, in this case, what you have are two primary source documents. In other words, two documents from ancient times that each deal <clears throat> with the flood. There was a massive flood in the Near East early in human history. It is the basis of the Noah story in the Bible, and it's the basis of the Gilgamesh epic, which is the first epic tale from ancient Babylon. What this does is it has both of these excerpts translated into modern English side by side, opposed views on the same topic. So you have primary source documents, people in ancient times writing in their own words, translated, of course, about the flood from the standpoint of a Jewish uh, background for the, for, Moses, for the Noah story and from the standpoint of a Marduk worshipping perspective from the standpoint of the Babylonians. What you're going to do, the point of the opposed views, is to see an ancient controversy or event from ancient eyes, but different perspectives. Okay? So what you're going to do is the Gilgamesh epic, that'll be the left-hand column of the three. The uh, Noah story from Genesis, that'll be the central column. What about the third column? Well, there is no third document in this chapter. Sometimes there are, not this chapter. So there are about a eh, half dozen to a dozen primary source documents that are not part of the opposed views. They have parchment colored paper in the background. This happens to be one of them. You find a primary source document with this parchment color in the chapter, and you select the one you want to do. You don't have to do any particular one. You can pick one that interests you. And you'll be analyzing this document, maybe if it's this one that you choose, or the document that you choose, uh, in the same way you'll analyze the primary source documents in the opposed views section. Here's the color of another document. Now, let's go over how to analyze it. Context, content, critique. Context. 
Well, there's a parenthetical statement there that sort of indicates what I mean by that. And context can be done in the list or bullet point form. Author, place and time, bias, audience, intent. Who's the author? Well, here I'll help you. The author for the Gilgamesh epic, which is the one on the left, was an ancient Babylonian. The author from uh, the second one, Genesis, you can say an ancient Hebrew, or you can say Moses, because Moses gathered together the first five books of the Bible, including the book of Genesis. The place and time. You find out it lists the dates, B.C., in your book, uh, when these two sources come from. You just place, you know, one is from uh, Mesopotamia, the other is from the Hebrews, so that's either Egypt or the land of Canaan or the Sinai Peninsula. Bias. Bias is a tough one. Bias is actually really hard for high school students to talk about. And it's not because it's hard to spot. Bias is actually so blatantly easy to spot sometimes, it's almost like shooting fish in a barrel. It's almost like it's too easy. It's like, okay, President Trump visits the riotous uh, torn town of Kenosha, Wisconsin, two days ago. You can get reports on it that say, he had no business being there. His racist ideas made it necessary for people to protest against institutional racism, and he was just making things worse. And you'd have the same event covered. The President of the United States fulfilled his constitutional oath to protect the Constitution against our enemies, foreign and domestic, by going to a city where the city government failed to protect people from rioters, in a state where the state government failed to protect people from rioters, uh, and the President offered what help he could. Same event. What's different? Bias. In the case of the first report, it was a liberal Democrat uh, or mainstream media attitude about President Trump's visit. In the latter, it was a conservative Republican, maybe Fox News, uh, uh, stance on the same event. In the case of the bias of these myths, the bias of the Gilgamesh epic is of a Babylonian believer. In other words, a believer in Babylonian paganism. You can write this down, but uh, in the case of Genesis, it is a Jewish believer. The bias is that God exists and that God is behind everything, good and bad. And there are reasons why God what does what he does, even if we don't understand what those reasons are. So there's your bias. Any questions so far? Author? You don't know who the author is of the, of the Gilgamesh epic. Uh, time and place and bias. Any questions on that? By the way, I love the fact that you are asking questions. And I hope that you are all parasitically benefiting from her asking questions. But I say this with joy in my heart. <laughs> if you rely her on her to ask, ask all your questions, you will be in trouble when you suddenly realize that she knew something that you didn't, and therefore she didn't ask about it. It would be wise if you have questions of your own to ask. Please go ahead. Uh, and don't be, I hope you're not embarrassed. No, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, for the bullet points, do you want to write complete sentences? No, they're bullet points. Uh, you're going to be writing enough paragraphs okay. on this, so you don't need to worry. Yeah, bullet points are fine. Uh, phrases, names. Uh, audience. Uh, the audience is Babylonians and uh, Hebrews. Uh, and the intent. The intent is to explain why this happens. Look, there are people today going, Why do we have this Chinese Communist Party virus? Why is COVID-19 doing what it does? Because some people, lots of people, have died and have lost loved ones. My mom had it. She was fine, but she had it. It's a scary thing. And people will ask, you know, like my uh, nephew last year, he had a senior year in high school. So he got to graduate during the lockdowns. You guys are entering high school during a time of weird hybrid school, wearing masks and being told what way to walk inside the school. That's crazy. So you might very well ask to the high heavens, why? 
Well, when your land is flooded out, lots of people do. It's happening in China right now. Lots of flooding. Gilgamesh epic tries to explain some things about the flood. Its effects, maybe its causes. Moses explains, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Moses in Genesis explains why the Noah story happens. And the answer is, it's, it's, a, it's a religious book. The people were immoral. They were living like jerks. So God said, wash them all out and start again. And that's the moral of the story. So the intent of the story in the Genesis is to warn people that God is not infinitely patient with sin and about sin. God is not infinitely patient about sin. As to Gilgamesh, um, I'll, I'll let you read it and come to your own conclusions. Now that's context. And for whatever third document you have, you'll do the same thing to the best of your ability. Any questions on that before we go into content? Okay. Content is what's it all about. Restate the essence of the story in your own words. So the essence of the Genesis story is God found the people sinful. He flooded the world to clean it of the sinful people. And only the faithful, Moses and the people on the ark, uh, survived. And it was a second chance for humanity. That's a way of describing, so I'd write that in the middle square under content. And if you wanted to use that, this is one of the few times you can sort of use my words. But I'll bet you, uh, you may add to it yourself. In any case, God was displeased with sinful people, so he flooded them out. Only the faithful on the ark survived. Mankind's second chance. You do the same thing for the Gilgamesh and for your third document. What is it about? Vocab. Oh, any questions on content? I might as well say this now. I have the boxes, the size they are, for a very particular reason. The boxes are an indication of how big an answer I want. Well, you're just judging us on how much we write. Yes, that's part of it. Because answers are like meals. If I'm expecting a nice big country breakfast with all the fixings for breakfast, and you give me breakfast that's a tea and toast, and that's all, I'm going to be disappointed because it's not what I was expecting. I want an answer of a certain size with a certain amount of reason and a certain amount of detail. So write, not tiny, tiny, but reasonably small, and fill the space uh, or come close to it with a good answer, a good description. Vocab. Each document should have at least two words that you're not particularly familiar with. They could be archaic words like indefinable, which means tireless, or they could be proper names like Gilgamesh or Enkidu. Uh, either way, pick two words, write the word down, and then write a phrase describing what it means. Simple. Two words, vocab, for each document. Finally, critique. Why in blazes are we reading this thing? What is interesting about it? Do you agree with it? Do you disagree with it? Why or why not? What is significant about it? And I expect you to come up with something other than the uh, bald, bearded, fat man made me do it. I did. <laughs> Power. But uh, I'm also doing it because there is something about these stories that has been worth remembering for a very long time. These stories are four or 5,000 years old. They're among the oldest stories that we have. So what is the significance of the story? What is the wisdom of the story? And do you agree or disagree? It should be more than a superficial answer. So that's the, um, the opposed views of document analysis. Any questions on that? Flip it. After the uh, putting things in order, the Baker workbook pages will have two sections of eight essays each. The sections are um, questions for critical thought, and analyzing primary source documents. Of the eight questions for critical thought, you are going to choose two of them to answer. Of the eight analyzing primary source documents, you will select one to answer. Freely choose among them which interests you the most. But this isn't a normal essay. You're going to be asked to give a thesis, a rationale, evidence, and what is the significance of it all. 
So it's not a free-form self-expressive essay. For example, <clears throat> you haven't go, gone over this yet, but why? what's the most important reason that the Roman Republic fell? Okay, evidence. And I'll give you like five or six events that happened in Rome. The destruction of the economy by slaves. The assassination of two tribunes called the Gracchi. Uh, the acquisition of private armies by powerful men. And civil wars between those private armies. That's the evidence. Ra uh, my thesis. The Roman people didn't have their freedom stolen. They gave it away. In return for safety. The Roman people gave away their freedom in return for safety. That's my thesis. That's the overall conclusion that I'm going to be right. The rationale is, with the economy ruined, many Romans had no income of their own. They became dependent on handouts. The tribunes who tried solving this problem came up with a controversial solution, but they were assassinated in public, and the people who ordered the assassinations were never punished. Once that happened, it was no longer about debates and voting. Instead of listening to Biden and Trump debate, why not just have the followers of one assassinate the other? Political violence became the norm. When political violence becomes the norm, the rich begin to build their own armies. How would it be if Elon Musk had his own air wing, if Bill Gates had his own tank division? Uh, and they decided that they were going to fight with their private armies in the midst of the country. That's what happens. The Roman people ultimately said, we want peace more than we want freedom. And they got behind a guy named Augustus who won all the civil wars. And they gave him all the power in return for him bringing peace and jobs. I covered that fast. I will hit these, uh, basically look at these descriptions. If you have questions about what I'm asking, come... Um, Monday, I'm sorry, come Tuesday with those questions, and we will talk about it. Basically, your essay is going to be written here in its component parts. I'm not going to ask for anything tight. I'm not going to ask for a final draft. Does your thesis, like any good history thesis, does your essay have a thesis, which is a, an overall idea that you're arguing? Does it have reasons for your argument? Does it have evidence from history that support your argument? And are you able to explain why it's important? Why is the fall of the Roman Republic important? Because we're based on Rome. We're not based on Greece. We're not based on China. We're not based on India. We are based on Rome. And if Romans gave up their freedom in return for peace in a time of trouble, so might we. We are susceptible to the same diseases, like some families have weak eyesight, and other families are susceptible to cancer. It runs in the family. We are, wait a moment. we are part of Rome's family. So that's it. Tomorrow, look for the videos. If you have questions, see me on the way out. Ms. Anderson, I'll try to get you signed in. And um, have a great weekend. You too. Thank you. You're eating lunch elsewhere. Uh, wherever everyone is. Uh, we're not here. Thank you for asking. Oh. I have to stop. Look at this. Bye.